three progressive organizations announced formation of something called the 2020 Bernie Delegates Network. It'll serve as a communications and action hub for uh, the Bernie Sanders delegates to the Democratic National Convention this time around. There are more than a thousand of them. Uh, uh, someone is here today representing one of those three organizations. Norman Solomon and I have talked over the years and corresponded over the years. I'm glad to finally get him on the program. Norman Solomon is the National Director of RootsAction.org, which is organizing this effort and sponsoring it along with our revolution and progressive Democrats of America. So without any further ado, Norman, uh, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Richard. Um, and uh, time blends uh, all together to me here, but it's true. I can't believe it. I think it's true that uh, in all this time, we've never had you on the zero hour. Am I right? Well, it's been uh, it's been years, I think. Yeah, okay. Well, my memory isn't what it used to be, so forgive me there. But uh, this is an important effort, and I want to make sure we highlighted it. So uh, let's talk about it for a second. Um, this has a lot to do with, to, in my mind, with maximizing leverage for the progressive movement going into the Democratic Convention. But that's just my first impression. What's the thinking behind it, this effort? Well, really, of course, with delegates from all over the country uh, for Bernie Sanders, the convention is an opportunity to raise key issues that really animated and motivated the whole Bernie 2020 campaign. And I should mention at the outset that the Bernie Delegates Network is independent of the official uh, Bernie Sanders campaign at the same time that it networks and, as you mentioned, serves as a hub for uh, communication and action among those delegates. And really, you know, whether we talk about Medicare for all or ending these endless wars or canceling student debt, uh, Green New Deal, and so many other uh, programs that are really essential for the future, uh, Bernie Sanders and the campaign have led the way. And now with the convention coming up, which will probably, I think, be virtual rather than in Milwaukee, whatever format that takes, people should be energized and find ways to advance a progressive agenda. One of the things that I think has been uh, complicated to navigate is that, uh, uh, Norman, at least in my thinking, has been that in my ideal world, Bernie's campaign would be understood to have been, and, and, and I understand your organization is completely independent from the campaign, but this kind of pertains maybe to uh, the context for what you, you are doing, which is, in my ideal scenario, uh, Bernie would have uh, acknowledged uh, and supported uh, the fact that uh, Joe Biden is going to be the nominee, but at the same time, in some way, continued his campaign to maximize the number of Bernie delegates and therefore of progressive delegates at the convention to maximize, you know, exactly the kind of influence uh, you're describing. But between the pandemic and everything else, uh, that hasn't really too clearly happened yet. I think the takeaway for everyone, including the Biden campaign, is that progressives are a force to contend with in the party. And so I'm wondering, assuming that the number is going to be, you know, more than a thousand, um, how can this, your alliance, maximize the leverage that does exist? If that, that's kind of a convoluted question, but I, maybe you get what I'm asking. Yeah, well, for sure, progressives are a force in the party, in the country. We saw that with the votes uh, for Bernie in various states. And I think on issues particularly, there is a clear message from the grassroots that although Bernie apparently won't be nominated, he's won, as he has noted, the ideological or the programmatic uh, struggle so when you've got a state like Mississippi that went overwhelmingly for Biden in the primary and the vast majority of the Democratic voters say they support a Green New Deal, which uh, Biden says he still doesn't support, you know, you've got a disconnect. And uh, we as progressives uh, basically have a sort of a uh, not fully galvanized uh, support base for a wide range of very progressive programs. 
And it's necessary for people who are organizers, activists, or and or just plain, plain progressive folks who are not particularly engaged even to see that uh, this is no time and there is no time to simply back off. And so with the Biden campaign evidently going to be successful, we don't know if we're absolute positive, but it looks like Biden will be the nominee, then the question is, uh, one of the questions is, are we going to uh, mute our voices? Are we going to just uh, tone down and not talk about those progressive goals? And I think clearly the answer should be, no, we don't uh, pipe down around those issues. People are dying right now because of the uh, shortfalls and the shortcomings, to put it mildly, of the healthcare system non-system. And when you've got millions of people who are going to lose their employer-based health insurance at the time of this pandemic, it just shows how Medicare for all is needed more than ever. So why in the world would progressives back off from asserting that? You know, this gets to an issue that I know you've struggled with we, and I've struggled with over the years, which is we hear a lot of talk, uh, mostly from, you know, I hate to use the word centrist, but more conservative elements within the party, often more dominant elements within the Democratic Party. We hear the word unity used. Uh, but in my mind, you know, there's a difference between unity and conformity, that we can say we're unified in our goal, for example, of defeating Donald Trump. We're unified in the goal of uh, taking away uh, the majority leadership of the Senate from Mitch McConnell. We, we, we can be unified on any number of goals, but that doesn't mean that we don't support the agenda we support, especially when... Uh, there's a lot of evidence, some of which you just mentioned, that everybody, the party would be better off embracing more of our goals. So how do you and the other groups involved in this effort envision uh, promoting that conversation with other Democrats, other delegates and the party leadership up to and during the convention? Well, I can speak uh, certainly for rootsaction.org and uh, as well, I know that the other two groups are Revolution and Progressive Democrats of America. We recognize fully the necessity of defeating Donald Trump. And that requires that in swing states, people vote for the only tool available uh, to dislodge Trump and prevent a second term for this monstrous, horrible president. And that would be in those swing states uh, voting for Biden. Roots Action has always been very clear, and we had uh, flyers on the ground in many of the early primary states about Joe Biden. We have fundamental differences with him. He does not represent a progressive vision or a progressive record, and we're not going to lie about that just because we see him as a tool at this point coming up, evidently, the only way uh, to defeat uh, Trump for a second term, the only way uh, in swing states is for uh progressives and others to vote for Biden. So that's that's just reality. And it's a very different uh, approach than the standard get in line uh, DNC uh, spin that, oh, all of a sudden this candidate who's going to be the nominee evidently is great. Well, he's not. It's just we have a, a far worse option, which is, is Trump. The uh, first convention I went to at that point as a journalist was in Atlanta in 1988, where Jesse Jackson said from the podium, it takes two wings to fly. And the pundits and the nominee, Michael Dukakis, didn't take that seriously. Uh, they had an 18 point advantage over uh, George Herbert Walker Bush at that juncture. They were very smug about it. They were dismissive of the progressive wing represented by what became the Rainbow Coalition. And the rest is history. When you diss the base, when you think you can't fly with one wing, we've gotten the result that Dukakis got. We got the one uh, that later on uh, you know, Kerry got. Uh, we got uh, Hillary Clinton got her result. And the hope is, uh, one of the hopes is that uh, Biden will have learned some lesson from that history. There's only one decision that Biden has to make uh, if and as he's the presidential nominee, Biden's got to choose a vice presidential candidate who doesn't further disenchant and alienate uh, the strong progressive base of the party. 
that's the vice presidential pick. And we know that four years ago, that was a very important choice by Hillary Clinton. The 2016 Bernie Delegates Network, which I was the national coordinator of, went ahead and did a one delegate, one vote survey election going into the convention in Philadelphia. Who do you support? Who would you accept? Who do you think is acceptable for the VP slot? Tim Kaine got 3% acceptable. Close now, to this 9% was... unacceptable. Okay, this was the Bernie delegates uh, who uh -huh. did the uh, essentially the vote, the survey vote, which was carefully uh, designed so that each one could get only one vote. These were several hundred people who cast their online ballot within the Bernie delegates network. So 3% of them think that uh, Tim Kaine is acceptable. And this goes to your question of unity. So Kaine gets picked, the corporate media predictably applaud, and he's a lackluster, centrist, boring establishment candidate, certainly didn't enhance uh, the uh, Hillary Clinton-led uh, ticket in 2016. So it goes to that point of unity. The version of people, if it's winner, Victor gets the spoils, the version is, oh, hey, uh, our unity is, um, as I think Clausewitz said, uh, that the, uh, the winner, you know, that the victor uh, gets to determine everything and then they want peace. You know, the, the, right. the winner, the victor, the conqueror is the lover of peace. But on what basis? And we're going to force uh, this uh, choice again because the choice is there no matter what. Will uh, Biden, if he's the nominee, is he going to choose uh, another corporate centrist like himself? Or is he serious about unity in some meaningful way, which means he would have to go to his left and show that he takes progressive seriously. And, and frankly, of all the names being bandied about in the corporate mass media uh, and in political uh, circles, there's only one uh, name that, that fits uh, the bill that would work for the ticket, and that is Elizabeth Warren. And frankly, all the other names are uh, corporate contenders and uh, would not uh, make it more likely to galvanize real unity to support Trump and to defeat Trump uh, in November. And again, we're talking with Norman Solomon, who is national director of rootsaction.org. Uh, you know, and we're recording this on uh, Thursday where there's a lot of uh, uh, rumors. Uh, there are a lot of rumors being generated about Amy Klobuchar being vetted, about uh, Elizabeth Warren, who you mentioned, being vetted. And, uh, you know, it strikes me, in, and I don't know, uh, Norman, if you want to uh, comment on the psychology of this, but there is, to a certain extent, some of this is uh, clearly tactical in that, you know, they want to get the left into line rather than make more historically, you know, as well as perhaps this year, uh, rather than make more concessions. Uh, but there's also this genuine culture in some Democratic Party circles of sort of shaming and resentment of the left. You, you, the same people who will say, well, we didn't get the, the moderate independents to vote for us last time around, so we have to reach out to them. And we didn't get this, this uh, the turnout was down in this demographic group in this state, so we have to reach out for them, it, it, which is, you know, logical. I guess if you want voters, you have to reach out to them. But when it comes to progressives who maybe 1% of them stayed home or whatever, or, then all of a sudden it becomes uh, this seemingly deep-seated resentment of, oh, do you, you know, this is your privilege or you don't care, as opposed to politics is a retail job. Uh, we didn't convince you. What can we do next time around to build your enthusiasm, to win your vote? It seems like that attitude is taken with everybody but progressives. And at least that's, I don't know if you agree with that observation, but if so, it strikes me that that's one of the obstacles that we progressives have is making people understand that the progressive base, whether it's young people or uh, or black voters who didn't turn out the last time around, uh, or whom and voter suppression has a lot to do with it, or or anybody else who who, who might have a left perspective, that 
you need us and you should reach out to us rather than scolding us. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I think I do. And I uh, hope you won't mind my saying uh, in passing that uh, no one's written better about uh, these dynamics than you have on Common Dreams and elsewhere. These are chronic problems that progressives have been facing and that, frankly, the Democratic Party has been facing in terms of being able to win national elections. There are powerful forces, whether it's at the Center for American Progress or other uh, dug in, highly financed institutions, Priorities USA and PACs and so forth, big super PACs. They hate the left. I mean, I don't know what you know, other more clear way to say it. What do you say about Anita Dunn, who now is at the top of the uh, Biden campaign after the last debate uh, between uh, Bernie and Biden? Anita Dunn said publicly, uh, widely quoted uh, in news accounts, that uh, Bernie was like uh, some protester who shows up on the on the stage to disrupt. And this is an attitude that I think Hillary Clinton had four years ago. Uh, progressives are seen, uh, genuine progressives. I mean, let's face it, there's a, an insurance company named Progressive. Anybody can label themselves that. But genuine progressives um, are uh, frowned upon by those who want to maintain the uh, Democratic National Committee and the so-called leadership on Capitol Hill, the Democratic Party, to uh, maintain that hold. And so this, this is a, not directly, I'm afraid, answering your question, except there was a theory being propounded a year or so ago when, and then when Bernie's uh, campaign grew very strong and coming into Nevada and so forth and doing so well there, but there was a theory leading up to that, that if those at the top of the Democratic Party power structure really had a choice uh, between Trump getting a second term or Bernie being the nominee and the president, they'd rather Trump have a second term. Uh, and this seemed like maybe a harsh assessment, uh, but the uh, reasoning behind it was, among other things, that if Bernie won and the progressive uh, forces uh, became dominant in the party structure, then uh, a lot of those consultants and a lot of those folks who have power in the party, they would lose out financially. They would lose out in terms of power. And I bring this up because when Bernie actually looked like uh, the nomination was in, uh, in his grasp, our grasp, earlier this year, there were a lot of people... Uh, not only on Wall Street, but some Democrats, uh, prominent ones, uh, who said, uh, well, I don't know if I could vote uh, for Sanders versus Trump. And you, you add to this that there's been a migration of uh, never Trump Republicans into the Democratic Party, if not literally in registration, then punditry of people like George Will and others. And that's also been a force to say, oh, you know, we have to uh, appeal to these somewhat mythical, supposedly large numbers of persuadable Republicans. But we know from the fall off of African-American and other voters for the Democratic ticket uh, between uh, 2012 and 2016, mobilizing the base is absolutely key. So it's not only an identity crisis of what the heck is the Democratic Party standing for, it's a tactical question of do you continue to become uh, so, so corporate and more and more corporate and more and more so-called moderate or centrist, or do you really see the future in young people who overwhelmingly in the primaries voted for Bernie? Do you see the future in people of color and people who have immigrated and so forth? And that is a different vision than those in control of the National Party really have, uh, their rhetoric aside. Well, you know, Norman Solomon, I think that uh, analysis is sound. I think there's an element of, definitely an element of self-interest in certain a Democratic Party institutions. And I also think, you know, a lot of the people who applauded, for example, Hillary Clinton saying, well, Bernie wants to give ponies to everyone, are a lot of the same people who applauded Democratic senators and members of Congress for voting uh, $786 billion, three quarters of a trillion dollars to the Pentagon that it didn't ask for, that Trump didn't ask for, just as a kind of extra give me. That's a lot of ponies to the Pentagon. And they yeah. applauded that, too. So uh, I, I think there's, you know, uh, there's a kind of 
anthropological and self-interest and a million things going on. But let me just, uh, if you will, uh, let me just flip the script for a second here, which is while I recognize, and a lot of people on the left are, are pointing this out, that gestures are cheap and all that, I have to say that I've been mildly and pleasantly surprised by the extent to which the Biden campaign, which has a lot of people working for it, you know, uh, you know, I think reflect different values in yours or mine, but the extent to which the Biden campaign has rhetorically reached out to the left, has Biden himself has made, uh, even though he hasn't made the policy changes to go with it, by and large, has talked about, you know, being, you know, an FDR type president, and then the uh, policy committees, the Bernie Biden committees, uh, have been a lot stronger than I expected. And of course, there's no l rule that says that a President Biden would have to adopt their recommendations. But but uh, the flip side of all of this is that I think the party and especially the Biden campaign has gone further, frankly, than I expected uh, up to now in our direction. Uh, but what do you think of that? Well, it's gone further than Hillary Clinton did four years ago. There, there's no doubt. And I think that's a, uh, a testament, uh, maybe not uh, so much for the, the good heartedness uh, uh, or inclinations of the top of the Biden team, so much as realism that uh, they recognize, at least at a tactical level, that they can't infuriate progressives. They need to bring prog progressives in if they want to get Biden into the Oval Office. And so at this point, the question though remains, and that's why I get back to the vice presidential pick, all of this can be blown off uh, after the inauguration. The VP pick is the only thing that can't be reversed. That said, there's a symbolism in you know, getting AOC uh, to co-chair a committee, of the, one of these six uh, joint committees and so forth. So that's, that's preferable. And the agenda is, uh, the discourse of the agenda is shifting in a favorable direction. It's really unclear how much of that is more than tactical. Uh, again, I think we just have to emphasize that Trump has to be defeated. And I'm not going to waste any time telling anybody if they're in a safe state how to vote. But I'm going to tell people in a swing state, I, I joined with Noam Chomsky and many others in saying we have a responsibility uh, hold your nose or whatever, but in a swing state, you do vote. We have to vote uh, for Biden if he's the nominee. Underneath all that is really about mobilizing power. I love something that one of the less well-known quotes from Martin Luther King in a book he wrote a year before he was killed, Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community? He said, uh, we know that uh, power without love is, is harsh and, uh, and destructive and cruel, uh, but uh, love without power is anemic. And progressives are tired of being anemic. Uh, we have a great program. That program has been embraced by certainly most Democrats, and in many instances, like Medicare for All, uh, the country as a whole, polling is showing, is supporting Medicare for All. So we have to fight for power, and that includes returning the hardball approach of the corporate centrist of the Democratic Party. But we can't just roll over and say, okay, this presidential campaign is over for progressives. We have to insist that we're going to fight for our principles and we're going to fulfill struggle and do everything we can to fulfill the dual responsibility of progressives, which is to fight the right wing and the xenophobes and the racists and the nativists and all the rest of it, and also to fight for a genuine progressive program. So, and I completely agree with that, Norman Solomon. And, and here's, um, here a, a couple thoughts about it for your consideration. One is that I think that uh, you know, the argument that we can't make our case while at the same time making a tactical case for uh, the need to defeat Donald Trump, which means uh, presuming he's a nominee, voting for Joe Biden, in, in, especially in those swing states, uh, I think that sells voters short because I think it's possible to make a case to somebody, a reasonable voter, that says, look, Joe Biden may not reflect uh, a lot of the policies we think the country and the world desperately needs if we're going to survive. 
because he's not supporting a Green New Deal at this point, and we need a Green New Deal. We could go down the list uh, 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 of those policies, but we need to stop Trump because of the economic, political, and power consequences of four more years of Trump. Uh, that, to me, I hate to use this phrase because it gets overused in our political circles, but that, to me, is a theory of change that says, uh, first, we defeat Trump, but we keep making our case for uh, stronger left progressive policies. Uh, we do it without regret or hesitation before, during, and after the election. Voters will understand. Uh, and in my view, we can build those policies more effectively with Democrats we can pressure in office than with uh, Republicans who couldn't, you know, don't even need to think about uh, getting us uh, on, on their side. Um, and up, some people push back and say, no, the Democratic Party is hopelessly corrupt. I myself was not a Dem registered Democrat for 10 years until a couple of years ago when I moved to Maryland and wanted to vote for my friend Ben Jealous in the primary. But, uh, you know, the, the that argument that, no, we're not going to vote for any Democrat, I respect. But then I say, OK, but then, you know, I'm just curious to know how you, you're going to get power. Um, do you get what I'm saying? And I'm, more, I'm very yes. interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it's a reality that we ought to face and not be in denial about that another four years of Trump means another four years of hitting a wall in terms of policy, not only in judicial nominations, but a whole host of matters where there's tremendous power being exerted by uh, the executive branch. And whatever progressive do, we hit that barrier. That is just real. And we've experienced it now, again, for more than three years, whereas you have a Democrat in the White House, there's the possibility to organize and really move policy in a progressive direction. We also have this dynamic that unfortunately uh, candidates uh, feel they need to adhere to that progressives at the grassroots don't have to. One of the things I think that the public generally hates about electoral politics is the hypocrisy and spinning on a dime and somebody who is being um, perhaps very justly criticized and critiqued, then after a certain juncture of primaries over, all of a sudden this is the greatest uh, candidate imaginable. People don't like uh, when there's a, a spin on a dime and uh, the uh, hypocrisy, the double standard, the, the 180 uh, is all too apparent. Progressives don't have to do that. We don't have to pretend that something magical has happened with Joe Biden. Nothing magical has happened with Joe Biden. He's the same uh, candidate and politician he's been for uh, 40 plus decades, supporting the credit card companies and, and all the rest of it, and uh, contributing to mass incarceration, uh, pushing the crime bill and his overall approach. But we can uh, give people the respect to say, we're gonna continue to be honest with you. And this is not, not only not our first choice, but day one, when he becomes president, we're gonna organize because we know that organizing for progressive programs and proposals is the only way that anything has ever gotten enacted in this country that we can be proud of. And I would make the contrarian argument that Joe Biden's record of pliability, uh, is one way to put it, might work to our benefit if we're shrewd about pressuring a Biden administration. Uh, I, I would argue that he'd be uh, more uh, pliable or amenable to pressure, however you want to put it, than a President Hillary Clinton, for example, would have been. So, but that's obviously hypothetical. Um, there's another aspect of this I wanted to talk to you about, uh, Norman Solomon, in terms of a the 2020 Bernie Delegates Network, because I think it gets overlooked. Uh, and I've talked to, uh, you know, on the program with Larry Cohen and a couple others about it. But I, I and that's building a, a different Democratic Party, uh, which means running or true progressives running for state offices, controlling those state delegations in the future. And to me, it also involves uh, building upon and improving the rules of the Democratic Party. And I was wondering, because otherwise the powers that be are just going to take it 
back even more uh, if we don't uh, keep the pressure on there. And I was wondering to what extent the 2020 uh, Bernie delegates network might be looking at influencing uh, internal Democratic Party rules and mechanisms and so on as part of its work. Well, absolutely. The platform and the party rules are two sort of prongs of what will be voted on in whatever form the 2020 Democratic National Convention takes. And if we look at what has been done uh, in the last few years, there have been some achievements because people organized. I would give a lot of credit to the Our Revolution organization. Uh, you mentioned Larry Cohen from Our Revolution at the time, Nina Turner also uh, a leader of that organization was on the Unity Reform Commission that that hatched uh, proposals around superdelegates. And if that kind of organizing, and I, I'm glad that at Roots Action we played a, you know some role in in pushing uh, to reform the party rules in that way. When you look at what would have happened without those uh, changes that progressives fought for and to some degree won, then going back a year ago almost we would have seen crawling across our computer screens and our um, TV sets and being uh, noted and tallied by reporters uh, that uh, Joe Biden had 100 and some or 200 some super delegates and Bernie had right. six or eight or 10. And, and before anybody had voted, the news media would be telling us that Biden was way ahead. The reason that didn't happen is because the efforts by many progressives forced the party to say that there would be no superdelegate votes on the first ballot. And these are the kind of examples, you know, and so what you're referring to is very important. In the long run, if you want a lower case D, Democratic Party, you've got to fight for it. No, I think that's right. And and by the way, as you know, I was working on the Bernie campaign in 2016, 2015, 2016. And those figures drove me nuts day after day. Hillary, yeah. uh, 1,200 delegates, Bernie, none. Hillary, 1,300 delegates, Bernie, 120. It was the impact that that had on the Sanders campaign, uh, incalculable. So that victory is huge. But if we don't have groups like the 2020 Bernie Delegates Network, uh, keeping the pressure on, they could roll that rule back. So yes. uh, rather yes. than building on it, move in our direction. So uh, I guess before uh, I let you go, Norman Solomon, uh, as I say, you know, as we're recording this, we don't have a word yet on um, on a vice presidential choice. Um, you know, if it if it's Elizabeth Warren, uh, I'll feel better about it. I'm not happy that yesterday she kind of walked back her Medicare for all support, but she would be head and shoulders above any other uh, name that's been raised, uh, in my view. Um, what if it's bad news? What do we do then? Uh, any thoughts? Well, we've already gotten bad news if Biden is the nominee. And I think we should push for and advocate for, in these circumstances, Elizabeth Warren, and make it clear that the other names being bandied about are, from a progressive standpoint, really uh, not enhancing or uh, progressive for our capacity even to, so to speak, sell this ticket uh, when November uh, comes close. This is, again, the need to speak realistically. And uh, somebody in the current situation that Bernie Sanders is in, well, he, he's somewhat constrained. But progressives at the grassroots, you know, it's about that idea that when people lead, leaders will follow. And there's a lot of leadership that has to be provided to the leadership of the party in the country, or they will be literally and figuratively just sort of in there underneath the dome, or you know, people would say the bubble, whether it's the Capitol Dome or whatever. And those, those are very rarefied uh, and isolated circles that reinforce each other. We've got to break open the system and really organize for genuine progressive change. Well, couldn't agree more. So where can people go to get more information either about what you guys are doing or or uh, the Delegates Network or anything else people should know about? Yes, well, there are a couple of sites people are invited to. Uh, the Bernie Delegates Network has relaunched its website, which is simply berniedelegatesnetwork.org. And also, of course, at rootsaction.org, we invite you to join for our action alerts. We have in the U.S. 1.3 million people who are active 
online in rootsaction.org. And uh, if somebody signs up, then it's uh, 1.3 million and one. And that's how we've uh, continued to grow. Well, Norman Solomon, uh, National Director of RootsAction.org. As always, thanks for all your great work. And as always, great to talk to you. Hey, thanks a lot, Richard.